All right, I think, are we? Are you guys ready to get started? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, all right, I'll just, I'll just go ahead and go first. Um, so, okay. if you guys are okay with that. <laughs> Um, so I, my topic was, um, passion. So I'm just going off of the, as, do you guys just all go off the reading, right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So my topic was passion and I guess the, the two, like right when I started the reading, I, um, had a couple of questions about like passion with, you know, pre with presentations. And the first one was why does passion make people listen? And the second one was, how does someone show passion for their topic when they're nervous? Because for me, at least with the first, our very first presentation, I felt like when I, when I like watched my own recording, I felt like I just was so bland and boring because I was so nervous about making the video of myself. I just felt so weird. And so it's really hard for me to like show any emotion when I'm giving a presentation just because it's just seems... It just, I feel like I just get so nervous that it just erases my ability to show any kind of emotion. And so that's kind of the thing, those are the things I was kind of keeping in mind um, when I was uh, like doing the reading, just to, because I feel like that's something I need to improve. So the first, um, the first thing that I, that kind of stuck out to me in the reading was it said, um, if presenters think about audience and all, they usually worry about themselves not being perceived as interesting, which I do worry about that when I have to present. It says, however, the issue is not so much you are showing how interesting you are. It's more about showing how deeply interested you are. So I thought that was, I that, that kind of like helped me a little bit, put it in perspective that instead of worrying about what my audience thinks about me, like focusing more on, um, like making sure my audience sees how how important my topic is to me and what why I care about it so much. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to quickly touch on was like why does why does passion make people listen? Um, and the 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 in the reading um, there was an example about a a girl that wanted to get a graphic design job in Seattle. And she wanted to move to Seattle because she had read all these statistics and read all these things that um, Seattle is one of the best places to move to if you want to make really good money as a graphic designer. And she had kind of made up her mind she was going to do that. And then she went and talked to her friend, telling her friend that she was going to try to move to Seattle to um, do graphic design. And her friend went on this whole like rant about how her brother lives in Seattle and he's a graphic designer. He's been looking for a job. He's been like looking for a job for a year and hasn't been able to find anything and how it's just been really frustrating for him. And, and they were talking about how like this girl, even though she read all these facts and facts and statistics, um, that she's more likely to listen to her, um, her friend that was like really passionate about like why her brother hasn't done well in Seattle as a graphic designer and so people are more likely to listen to people who are showing, like, when they can make an emotional connection with what you're saying. So um, those were kind of the two things I wanted to touch on. But I think, um, at least for me, it's something I really need to improve on. And, and then the last thing was that um, why does passion make people listen to us and pay more attention is because we're social by nature and, um, like, we're built to be together. And um, passion and and excitement or any emotion like is draws people in and it's like it's the reason that we're so we love watching like drama on tv or drop like reading about like dramatic things and watching the news and stuff is because um it's it, there it makes us feel something and that's what we need to try to do i think as when we present is try to make people feel so that's that's my that was my whole that was the main things that stuck out to me in our reading Nice. Great job. <laughs> All right, who wants to go next? I'll go. All right. Okay. So first of all, Caroline, did you get the uh, recording going? I did. I started it up. Okay, good. Because mine was not. I needed to update my whole thing. So just, okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, mine was on clay. Um. Okay, so when I went to the temple devotional on Sunday, um, our temple president 
had uh, this chain -like link armor with the circles on it. And he actually held it up and showed it to us. And then he had his link arms. And I remember this because he, first of all, showed us something and they had us do something. It was really kind of awesome to be able to link arms with the people right next to us. And to me, he showed um, good play with, and good engagement within his talk. Not necessarily a presentation, but it was something that engaged us. And I think that that went along with uh, what play was. Um, um, one of the things I liked about brainstorming was that you um, could, there, there weren't many rules. The thing was is you, nobody could say anybody else's ideas weren't good. So um, I like that, and it gives us freedom to, to uh, explore and get new ideas. And I really like brainstorming because it helps. Um, play creates a relaxed feeling of connection between the presenter and the audience and among the audience members themselves. Play fosters a collective experience of engagement with the content. That doesn't mean you shouldn't take the needs of the audience and the material, ser material seriously. It's important to take our work seriously, but we should be careful not to take ourselves too seriously. We don't need to be somber. We are trying to affect a change in people. Um, and so um, I should have read that with the chain link armor part. Um, also, our temple president has a bit of humor, um, and so that helped in his talk or his presentation because that kind of eased up the moment. And they talk about um, just playing laughter can lead to joyfulness, which in turn can lead to greater creativity, productivity, and collaboration. Um, well, let's see, what else about play? Um, I don't know if some of you took a class. Um, at BYU-Idaho where it was a designing class and there was a professional who was trying to create a logo and he had a bunch of boxes of trinkets and books and cute little things that he kept um, so that when he needed to do something, he would go through that and explore. Um, and I thought that was a, um, a good idea for um, keeping play within the work as well. Um, our society generally condemns adults who dare to play at work. Um, so last but not least, um, bringing a spirit of play to your presentations and the feeling of exploration and discovery that it instills in the moment improves learning and stimulates creative thinking. Um, but often it's good to play for no other reason than to have great fun and feel good and feel recharged. So that's my take on play and the book's take on play. So next. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'll go next. Um, and my topic was about proximity. And when I thought about proximity, you know, I thought about uh, the relationship between family members and friends and just, you know, just associates. Um, it really depended on, um, you know, how close uh, within space these two or three particular people are to each other. So when you put that in a visual aspect, people will be able to understand that, okay, these two things, these two people have some sort of relationship, depending on how close they are um, in terms of space, you know, um, so, you know, like we have two characters in a PowerPoint or in some other presentation and, you know, the closer the characters are, the more we'll think and say, okay, you know, they, they have either intimate relationship or they're just family members, whatever those, those, those two things, but the further away they are from each other, the more we'll simply say, okay, maybe they're, you know, just simply friends or, you know, maybe just associates or, you know, co-workers at work, you know, whatever the case may be. So we always have to remember that proximity is always about um, the spacing in between particular characters, you know, whether it's family members, friends, whatever the case, and people have the perception. Uh, we, we always have to think 
um, of what other people are thinking in terms of uh, proximity. So, Can I say something funny, Ken? Yeah. This is April. I just want you to know, speaking of proximity, it's a great example with the Marlboro, <laughs> you being at work and the, and the stand behind you. I mean, it's, it's great. And it goes along with what you were saying as far as, um, you know, you know, people observing us and, and things like that. But the spacing is great. I just thought I'd be funny. Okay, Here's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's it for me. So. Cool. Cool. All right. Is it okay if I jump in next? Yeah. So I'm going to try to see if I can share with you guys my screen, because I did make a little bit of a PowerPoint with just a couple bulletins. Let me see if I can get this to work real quick. Are you guys able to see my PowerPoint right now? Yes, I am. So we'll jump into it real quick. Um, so basically, passion. What I liked in the book is, uh, right, right off the back, the book says, uh, in Japanese, the word passion is composed of uh, two characters, feeling and heat. So really, passion is the opportunity to kind of captivate your audience, um, kind of allow them to feel the emotion. I, I know a lot of times passion is perceived as love or hatred or feelings, but oftentimes passion is kind of, uh, you know, like I said, making, making the audience know how important your topic is to them. Um, passion is oftentimes a motivator. It kind of allows uh, your, your, your audience to know how you truly feel. It allows you to express yourself, kind of show, show your true interests and show yourself. Now, a lot of what the book talks about is um, not being afraid to show passion, not being afraid to show our personalities, because, you know, that's kind of what makes a presentation a presentation. Uh, a lot of times people get really bored with speeches when they're really monotone or they lack passion. Or, you know, if it's, you know, for example, a church talk that you don't really feel very passionate about, your presentation oftentimes is just going to be flat out boring. There's not going to be a lot of meaning behind your words. And so as a presenter, when you have passion, uh, it's, it's really easy for your audience to see it, to feel it, and kind of know the importance. Um, there's a little message that I like that was in the book. It said, don't worry how interesting your audience thinks you are. Worry about how interested you are uh, in your topic. So... That's just kind of a big thing to remember when we're being passionate in our talks is to, you know, not worry so much about what the audience thinks. Just make sure that they um, see how interested you are in the topic that you're speaking about. So that's 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 really all kind of I had about passion. Okay. Good. Um, I can go next unless someone wants to. Um, I also have a play like Sandra, and um, I really like the, it was a brief little snippet about it, but I really like the author's example. He talked about how he went to Hawaii, and there was a band playing, and there was this girl who was dancing um, like by herself in front of this band. And she was just having fun. And he kind of compared that to, like, our childhood and how when we're kids, we're not really concerned with, um, like, what people are saying or what, you know, if they're watching, but they just know how to play. And that how, and, and how that's fundamental to who we are as presenters. And, um, and so I just like what he said, especially when he said, um, about the girl and how she wasn't concerned with uh, what anyone else was thinking or if she was good enough as a dancer. And he said that that ties in to being playful with our presentations and how we need to be less concerned about um, how we're perceived, kind of like uh, what the last reader was saying, but more so just trying to be comfortable and conversational. Um, and then I also just thought of an example in my own life of a playful um, presenter, and that was my favorite seminary teacher. I felt like he was really relatable to me and our age group at the time when I was in high school. He was very fun. Um, but at the same time, he had really powerful lessons, and he just knew how to incorporate um, fun and each lesson. Is anybody else's sound wigging out? I had a train there. I think I think it might have been a microphone. Okay. Um, I'll go next, unless someone else wants to. Go for it. 
Okay. Um, I also had proximity, uh, like Ken. Um, a, the book starts out and just it starts out immediately, just saying. Generally, sometimes when people present, they're behind something, they're behind a, a post or a podium or something, and that puts kind of a, a little physical block in between you and your audience. So it it wants you to get out behind that to be close to the audience to just seem to become literally closer in proximity um, to make it seem like you know them, you're talking to them specifically, or you're talking to, you're, you're having a conversation, but you're the one giving the speech. So like what Kent was saying earlier, uh, proximity can indicate intimacy or relationship or just uh, comfort with people. Generally, in, in when you go to something, you'll gravitate towards people you know because you know them, you know them best than the other people around you. So generally, proximity does make you feel close to other people. Um, the book says also to uh, when you're presenting with a computer or something, uh, don't stick close to that. Like if you have to do it with your hand or something, you, you can do that. Just don't stick close to it if you if you don't have to. Like have a small remote that just makes it seem like you are showing them. You're showing them the data. You're showing them, but you're still talking to them. And then you can use you can use the presentation itself, like uh, the PowerPoint from earlier. You can physically somewhat physically interact with it, just make it seem like you're moving, you're being there, you're actively showing uh, what's happening and what is what is going on. That's basically what proximity is in terms of the book. Uh, who else wants to go next? I can go. I actually went last night, but if Mine's on play, so I don't really need to go if somebody else wants to go. Or do you want to hear about play? <coughs> All right, we'll just hear about play then. So um, so my subject was on play. And really, um, last night I told the story, but you'll have to watch the video in order to know the story. But um, that's a little teaser for you guys. Um, but really... Play is about, you know, remembering, you know, what we were like and engaging and, you know, with the people and being yourself, um, letting, letting the audience um, know who you are and really will break down barriers between, you know, you and them. Ultimately, you are there to provide something for them. Um, and I think if, if we remember to keep it light, even in a, in a hard situation, it, um, you know, or a hard topic or whatever, um, you know, drawing in your own personal experiences is, uh, is play. And it was interesting, the definition um, in the book said, you know, the opposite of, of play is depression, which I thought was very profound and interesting. But, um, you know, to really think that that is the extreme of play. But um, tell a story. Share something about yourself. Um, I obviously do really bad at the three-minute thing. But so I won't bore you. But um, anyway, so just, you know, keep it real is, and, and remember, that's how you really engage and connect with people um, and, and break down any barriers that you have. There you go. Cool. I think I might be the last one, maybe. Uh, not sure. Uh, I also had passion. Um, so... Let's see. So um, all presentations have to have passion, uh, along with energy, sincerity, um, a smile, and total engagement with the present. Um, and I think uh, the, the final four of those ones fall under passion. Passion is like, like the main topic, and those are the subtopics of it. 
um, Anthony Robbins uh, in the uh, was quoted in the book as saying, "Passion is the genesis of uh, genius," and I think that was a very profound statement. But it doesn't exactly say what passion is. It says that passion sparks um, genius, is what it's saying, um, and I think that the passion is. Um, as the author described, um, like uh, heat and emotion, like heated emotion. Um, the book then went on to describe um, being interested versus interesting. Uh, when you're interesting, you're too worried about the other people and you aren't really focusing on what you're doing, as opposed to when you're interested in your own topic, um, you show your audience that you are interested and they will be too. And I think that really ties in with um, the next topic that the book brought up, which was um, mirror neurons. Uh, they're very important uh, when it comes to presentations because um, you have to show the behaviors that you wish your audience to emulate. Um, uh, it's very important that you as the presenter realize what you're doing and are aware of your actions, uh, not just um, your words, but also your body language, everything else about the presentation that the audience can see. Um, it's also important to be animated and to share your emotions. That will help ensure that your audience develops your own passion for the subject. And uh, I think one of the most important things about a presentation that is pr brought up a lot now, but not as much in uh, like a couple of years ago, was the importance of smiling sincerely. People can tell when you fake any emotion, usually. Um, so people will be able to tell when you fake your smile. Um, sincerity breeds trust uh, with your audience. And when they can tell that you're being sincere with them, they will trust you more and listen to what you have to say. Um, smiles are also contagious, like emotions. So um, uh, when you smile, you help share your own passion. And these people will smile more, and that will help them become more engaged overall. Um, that's pretty much it. Great job. Yeah. I remember when I heard that about the smiling, I thought, oh, that is so true. Because when I see someone, say, like a church and we're in the store, you just go, and you just give this little smile. It's not really a full engaged smile. And it totally made, totally um, made sense to me. But, you know, if I'm going to smile, I might as well do it the whole way, you know? Yeah. Austin, are you sticking around for 10 o'clock tonight for any of the other classmates, or? Um, I can. I have nothing else to do, really, so probably. Okay. Yeah, I think maybe somebody will show up. If you're if you're willing to do that, that'd be awesome. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm totally fine doing that. I'll I'll pop in and make sure that there's some people there, and if they don't need me, I'll leave. Okay. But, um, so is there, there's another meeting at 10 o'clock tonight. Is it 10 p.m. Mountain Time? Yes. I, yeah, 10 p.m. Mountain. Okay. Yeah. Is Thursdays at, at 7 o'clock oh, usually a good time for everybody? Are we going to have to meet again? I am i don't know, but I think it's a good opportunity to inquire. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so if, if we just need to be prepared. I mean, it seems yeah. like there's quite a large group on tonight. There were five of us mm. last night, five or six of us last night. So, Well, I know at least for me, I have Young Women's on Wednesday nights. And mm. I think a lot of people have, like, I have to be at the church on Wednesday night. And I'm usually there till like, pretty late. So, Gotcha. Okay. Um, well, third, yeah, I mean, Thursday is, is, we can certainly shift to Thursday is what the consensus was, I think. Yeah. I didn't know about the later meeting. I will not be in attendance for that one. <laughs> well, if we um, if we uh, if we have to meet again on like this, I will send another message out to our whole class, and I'll set up another meeting on Thursday. If we have to do this again, I'll do another Thursday at seven p.m. Mountain Time, okay. and then we can that great. we can do this again if we ha if we have to utilize a group meeting again. So, hmm. <laughs> thank you guys. Thank can I ask Austin another question? Austin, yeah. I think Kent was the one who said he could meet at 10, but I think mm -hmm. London said she could meet sometime tonight, but I didn't see her here, but she didn't specify. I, time, so. I actually saw her message. I Let me check really quick what she said. Um, where is my inbox? 
while we're waiting, uh, I that guy. I haven't gone yet. <laughs> oh, you haven't? Oh. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, you're good. My oh. phone is having issues, so. Oh, is this the guy on the iPhone? Uh, this is the one that's, uh, webcam isn't working. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. No, it's all good. It's all good. I was just letting y'all go first, and then I was just kind of waiting, but I promise I'm a real person, so <laughs> sorry, that, sorry the video's not coming through. You're not missing much anyways without the yeah. visuals, so. <laughs> um, you guys okay if I go, or are you guys still figuring that out? Or? Please, please do. Oh, absolutely. Go for it. Okay, I'll be real brief. Um, but I also had proximity, like a few of y'all did. Um, and just like from studying the reading, I, I saw three different like types of proximity. So proximity is basically like the distance from the audience. And like that's both like a literal distance as well as like an intellectual distance as well. Um, so the first like form of like the distance that you create is like from physical positioning. And so the, the book talks about like how important it is to remove it, the obstacles or like obstructions uh, that your viewers or audience has to you. So like just trying to be more more so like out in the open. Um, and then be also being able to be like close enough to the audience to engage with them, but not like super uncomfortably close. So like you don't want to be like a foot away from the audience, but like maybe a few feet just so that way like they're able to see you, you're able to interact with them better um, rather than being like on a podium or on stage, because sometimes it's difficult for people to um, interact that way. And then also, like, one thing that I thought was interesting, too, was moving the audience closer together. A lot of times, like, people, especially, like, when they um, congregate in large groups, they tend to kind of spread out. And so, like, I know for me personally, like, church, for example, I'm, like, as soon as I walk in, I go straight to the back row. And so, like... Um, Helping people, like, in inviting them to sit closer up front or sitting, having them sit, like, more so in the middle. Um, helps with the physical positioning to create a good proximity. And then also talks about how important it is to use good language and, and like, diction, having a good word choice. And so it's important to use concise words so that way people can understand what you're talking about. And then also um, being able to use language that isn't too formal. So that way your message doesn't go above your audience's heads, but then also not using it to, not dumbing it down too much to the point where your audience feels like they're, that you're talking to them like they're children. And then finally with visual aids and technology that can help create proximity as well. Um, when you have tech that is visible, if you have like too many wires or if your laptop is visible or like something not functions on your laptop, that can create a distraction and kind of distance you more so from uh, from the audience. And then when difficult when technical difficulties occur, like if your webcam video doesn't work or something like that, um, just being able to stick to your to your topic and being able to focus on that can really help bring your audience back in rather than drawing like in excess of attention to those distractions. And then finally, always have a backup plan to maintain that proximity in case there are technical difficulties. If you have like an alternative uh, visual aid or another like alternative way to interact with your audience. So, anyways, sorry, I tried to go kind of quick, but that's what I got. That's great. I always fear, you know, the technical difficulties. <laughs> mm. yeah. Backup plans are good. Yeah, if I were to do a presentation in front of a large group, I think I'd have two computers. I would have, you know, a tech person there, and kids, you know. Anyway, uh, so Austin, did you find out anything different? I haven't found out anything different. She just said later this evening, so I'll just pop in at ten and make sure that she's there. And if not, I'll reach out to her. Oh, and who wants to submit the list of names. 